Hi, Alan. Yo. How you doing? The man, the meet the legend. I'm really well. How about you? I'm doing great, Daniel. Thank you so much for inviting me on. And I see that people are coming in. So, yo, yo. Um, oh, I'm thanks really for your time. I really appreciate you taking the time. It's a huge honor. The OG of the evidence-based fitness community, I would say. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Very well. So how's your book? Uh, the protein book is, is great, man. I've gotten a lot of great advice. Uh, great advice. Yeah, I've gotten good advice for it. Good feedback for it. Um, I finished a, another book, which is actually, it's published by Victory Belt. So it's the same right. same publishers who did... Uh, some other big books, man. Um, they actually did. Have you heard of a book by Kelly Starrett called Becoming a Supple Leopard? No, I don't think I'm familiar with it. Okay. That's, that's their, that's their uh, kind of their big, their big hit. They also uh, published a right. book called The Paleo Solution by Rob Wolf. Oh, that one. That one I do know. <laughs> yeah. Um, they also published Glute Lab by this guy named Brett Contreras. The glute guy, infamous glute, glute guy. guy, of course. Very well. So now they, you know, they approached me last year um, to do a book. They said, you know what? We want you to write the, the, the book on uh, evidence-based nutrition stuff because uh, as far as we can see, it doesn't, it doesn't really exist out there. There's just guys who, you know, they've, they've, they've shot their shot but we want you to shoot yo shot into this into this pond here so i'm like yeah let's do it man let's do it and so over the past year i i, I wrote a book man <laughs> <laughs> i'll be for sure looking forward to it man dude dude ah uh, well as soon as it's done uh, honestly as soon as there's a print copy um remind me just say hey alan when is that thing going to print i'd like a, a pre a pre-print uh Copy, and I'll, I'll send you one, sure. Oh, man, that's a huge honor, man. I feel really flattered. You just oh. made my day, actually. <laughs> dude, dude, yeah, remind me, because there's like a, a, a few would, people I have on my list. and right. um, But yeah, yeah, just DM me afterwards. Say, hey, Alan, remember what you said about your, your Thanks book? a lot for that one. We'll be looking forward to it. Cool. Very well, so, so let's dive right into it. All right, actually, brother. If you're okay with it, I would like, because you're the OG of the, the fitness, the evidence-based fitness community. Um, before the, the nutrient timing topic itself, what does it mean to be evidence-based? Because, you know, there's this dichotomy with the nutrient timing, for example, that, oh, you don't know that that doesn't matter. The bros were wrong. You have these this camps that doesn't matter, matters a lot, and it, it becomes this dichotomy, which is really not necessary at all. So if you're okay with it, can we begin by defining what does actually mean to be evidence-based? Sure, that's a really good question. It's a question that I don't get asked a lot, but it's so important. Evidence-based practice, it is a three-part, um, it's a three-component approach. So one of the components is the published research. So that's, right. I guess it could be called the, the, the basis of it all. It's what's, what do we know? field as practitioners because you know as vast and deep as the body of research is there's still a lot we don't know there's still a lot we have not studied um and so we can't there, there's a lot of gray area in the body of pubmed indexed research so we have to fill in the gaps by looking at what we've seen in, in clients what we've seen in, in patients uh, what we've what we've seen in in ourselves over, over the careers of of, of our um, development, and so that that's component number two is what we've seen in the field, and the third component is um it's kind of related to what we've seen in the field, but it's what we've seen, uh, the individual response that that clients may have that could possibly be different from what we see in the in the research literature so individual response is the third component so number one what we've seen in the in the research literature number two what we have seen in our own field observations like our own expertise and number three 
what, what is the individual response of our clients that, that may or may not be different from what, what we see in the literature? Because you know what, man, you can take what we see in the literature and you can work with somebody, base a program on it, and they do not, they do not respond according to what the, the research right. says. And so at that point, you have to just throw that all out and just say, okay, I'm just going to work with how this individual responds because he does really crappy on, on very high protein. So I'm going to put him on moderate protein or, you know, stuff like that. And so, and so that's evidence-based practices is taking all three of those components and using them instead of just saying, hey, man, look at this abstract from PubMed. This is what it says here. And so this is why I'm right, because look at this, look at this study, you know, that's not evidence-based practice. And also one, one key aspect of that is the hierarchy of, of said evidence, because um, we could think, okay, um, anecdote, it's not relevant per se, but it's not the same, uh, it's not the same, the anecdote from somebody that's been working with power, the elite power lifters, elite bodybuilders, than somebody that just says uh, maybe nutrient timing doesn't matter at all. And then we have the meta analysis that you can say are on the top of the pyramid. But as you know, as one of your meta actually, mm, it depends on which studies were available. It depends also on the, the statistical analysis, all that stuff. And I think it's really important to keep that in mind when we talk about also evidence based. Can you talk a little bit about that? Alan? Yeah, yeah, for sure, man. That is such a good example. The, the meta analysis that I did with um, Robert Morton, Stu Phillips, and a few other guys actually brought Eric Helms in on, on that, that uh, publication. Um, it, 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 okay, before I, before I talk about that, the evidence hierarchy, picture it as like, um, like a pyramid, you know, right. and at, the, at the bottom bottom of, of the of the hierarchy the least or the or the weakest evidence would be basically anecdote and opinion you know that like what people have seen and, and heard and kind of like Jim Jim Lo Jim Locker hearsay you know that that's that's at the bottom of the evidence hierarchy and then moving our way up we have observational research observational research encompasses things like epidemiology. So with observational research, we're looking at very large populations for very long periods of time, but we're not doing any interventions. We're not controlling any of the variables. We're just observing and noting any potential correlations between the, the variables. That's all we can do with observational literature, like, for example, uh, red meat raising the risk for heart disease, those, those types of things. Okay. <laughs> um, and then one level up from that, we have controlled interventions where we actually control the variables and see whether there is a causal relationship between agent X and effect Y. And that those are randomized controlled trials. That's, that's the third tier up on the evidence hierarchy. And then at the top tier, top of the, the, the pyramid, the highest or strongest form of evidence would be what we sometimes refer to as the weight of the evidence or totality of the evidence, which is usually captured in systematic reviews and meta-analyses. And usually you would want to go for, you want to put more weight on the meta-analyses of randomized control trials instead of meta-analyses of the observational studies. Totally. So yeah, so that's at the top of the pyramid there, man. And, and, um, and you brought up an interesting piece of literature when you talked about the meta-analysis that I did with Phillips and Morton, we looked at whether protein supplementation increases um, fat-free mass and, and strength and mu muscle size and strength. Right. And of course, you know, we gathered up, uh, gosh, I, I, I'm trying to remember just how many studies is slipping my mind. Um, we, we pulled together the data from all of the relevant literature across multiple populations, trained folks, untrained folks, uh, men, women, as well, mostly men in the protein supplementation literature. And we found out that, uh, oh, this is really important too, man. We did not include studies that 
were hypocaloric. So we did not include studies where people were in a calorie deficit. So that, that, would, have changed the, that would have changed things a little bit. Um, we only include eucaloric or just like zero balance, like maintenance calories or hyper hypercaloric conditions. And so with all those studies, with protein supplementation, we concluded that at a protein intake of about 1.6 grams per kilogram, Right. Um, that is that looks to be somewhat of the 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 sweet spot or or the amount of protein where the majority of trainees will see the most effects on gains in, in muscle size and strength at 1.6 grams per kilogram of body weight. Now, now there there's a small percentage of individuals, very small, who will benefit. Um, from taking in as high as 2.2 grams per kilogram of body weight. That's on the upper end of the so-called 95% confidence interval. And so what we concluded from our findings, we said, you know what, if you want to gain muscle size and strength maximally, and you don't want to take any chances, then consume somewhere between 1.6 to 2.2 grams per kilogram of body weight if we're talking about protein. Now, I've argued with Stu, Stu Phillips. I've argued with yeah, him. Yes, sure. I actually asked him uh, a while back about that very same subject that maybe subjects in a hypocaloric condition would need actually a little bit more protein. But he, he said, if I remember correctly, uh, we're not really sure about that. Maybe in the range of 1.6 to 1.2 covers, covers everything. I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt. Well, Stu, Stu, I love Stu. He's an interesting dude, and he's obviously brilliant, but it took him like 10 years to, to agree that we need more than 1.2 to 1.5 grams of grams per kilogram. <laughs> so we got him at 1.6. It took like 20 years. We got him from 1.2 to 1.6. So, you know, God bless you, Stu. Um, and, and now, in hypocaloric conditions, there is a shit ton of, uh, of data showing that protein intakes above 1.6 grams per kilogram benefit these athletes, these dieting athletes, these lean, sure. athletes, lean dieting resistance training athletes. Helms did a systematic review on this where he found a range of uh, uh, 2.3 to 3.1 grams per kilogram of fat free mass uh, mm -hmm. being the sweet spot now the issue with with that systematic review is that it didn't necessarily look at um comparisons of uh controlled comparisons where 1.6 grams per kilogram was the lower protein amount in the comparison so that's what we're lacking in the literature mm -hmm. we don't have any studies comparing 1.6 <laughs> with something higher you know uh, we've got Longland and colleagues back in um, 2016, 2017. You know, Longland, it could have been as far back as 2014. He compared um, 1.2 versus 2.4 grams per kilogram in hypocaloric conditions. Now, when that study, and of course, 2.4 gained more lean mass than 1.2. And you can imagine, he, you know, he didn't use trained subjects because they both yeah. gained in a very severe caloric deficit. It was like 40% below maintenance levels. So anyways, when that study was published, all of the bros are like, ah, oh, damn, we knew that we knew that 1.2 wasn't optimal. Why don't you test something like 1.6 that we're all debating about? You know, 1.6 versus 2.4 in hypochloric conditions. Let's see if there's any difference, you know? That would have settled a lot of the arguing that Stu and I do. And, uh, but the fact is, because we don't have that data, there's still that gray area, my man. And, and that brings us back to um, not only the evidence hierarchy, but evidence-based practice. If I was going to work with a client on, on gaining muscle um, as quickly as possible, or preserving a maximal amount of muscle, and even trying to gain muscle in hypocaloric conditions, I would not put them at 1.6 grams per kilogram. Right. I would not. There's, 
just too much data suggesting that 50 to 100% higher than that it, it works best for things like preserving muscle and also for things like recomposition where you are gaining muscle while losing fat, in which this is possible in beginners and, and intermediates to a certain degree. But, but yeah, dude, I, I'm not willing to, I, if, if there was a lot at stake, I would not put somebody on 1.6 grams per kilogram of body weight, especially in hypocaloric conditions. And, they, and, they were, and there was a lot on the line for me to make sure they got results. I think we can, we can summarize the evidence-based mentality as, uh, for the best of our knowledge, <laughs> as the evidence is limited on all, the best we can do is something, something, something. Not this paper say so, this abstract say so, and you don't know because you're a bro. Which I, I think it's a quite a dichotomy, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, that's, that's the one for sure. Very well. So that brings us actually to the topic at hand, nutrient timing. Okay, um, cool. Is it really the future of sports nutrition? Do you remember that book, John Ivey, Robert Portman? Which was actually it was actually really interesting. I think it, it, it was like a watershed for all this all this all this research. Mm -hmm. But one thing to keep in mind is the, the evidence that they had available. There is no really specific um, of of scenarios that they don't specify. Like in hypocaloric, in this sort of sort of activity, sort of sports, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All these considerations that you really need to have when you think about the nutrient timing. Can we begin about about that book and why it was actually interesting and really important? Like I said, like a watershed for all the research that came before, after. I'm sorry. Yeah, that was a 2003, <clears throat> 2004, and so back in 2003, we they had only short-term or acute studies on things like muscle protein synthesis and also things like uh, the speed of glycogen resynthesis. And so they kind of put the pieces together and, and concluded that, you know what, there's this anabolic window that's about 30 to 60 minutes post-exercise where if you don't consume quickly absorbed protein and carbohydrate, You're going, to consume, you're going to compromise the recovery process and you're going to compromise the growth process. So Ivy and Portman, they hypothesized that the timing of uh, nutrients within the post-exercise anabolic window is more important than your total nutrient intake for the day. And that was really, that was the prevailing belief for another five, six, seven years until the longitudinal studies started rolling out. When I say longitudinal, I mean studies that lasted more than a few hours. Studies that, I'm talking about studies that lasted a few weeks, a few months. So with longitudinal studies, we can observe whether these hypotheses like the post-exercise anabolic window and et cetera, we can uh, examine whether they're valid and whether there's faster muscle growth uh, in the nutrient timed in the anabolic window models versus let's say a placebo or a delayed timing model. Okay, so with that, with that out of the way, I, I want to mention that Ivy and Portman's book was, was important because it got the research ball rolling on that topic. So they base their hypothesis largely on um, the fact that if you waited after you train to consume carbohydrate, then at two to four hours later, you would have significantly less glycogen replenish um, within the muscle tissue. So if, if you had immediate amounts of car immediate large amounts of carbohydrate after training, then if you measure the muscle glycogens four hours, hours later, it was like double the amount than if you waited. Okay, so they, they also looked at muscle protein synthesis. So post-exercise, if you immediately took in a certain amount of protein or amino acids versus if you waited like an hour or more after training to take in your your amino acids or your protein, 
Then what happened was muscle protein synthesis over the course of a few hours or over the course of the day would be, would be lower. Okay, so now, okay, th th this is the thing that, that's important to realize. What happens within a few hours of exercise in terms of muscle glycogen resynthesis or in terms of muscle protein synthesis, while that's interesting, that stuff has to be compared with what actually happens with body composition over a period of weeks or months. Okay, so right. what happened was from 2009 onward, so this is, like I said, about six years after Ivy and Portman's book was published. From 2009 onward, the studies started rolling out, the longitudinal studies started rolling out that compared protein timed conditions where protein was taken in in the, in the so-called post-exercise anabolic window versus delayed. And interestingly, there, it, it, there was an inconsistency of results. So the protein timing model didn't always work. And so six studies piled up, 10 studies, uh, more studies. And then uh, Brad and I took a look at this, and this was in 2013. Brad Schoenfeld and I, we, we looked at these studies and we said, you know what, it doesn't look like the post-exercise anabolic window concept is valid. Otherwise, we'd be seeing greater muscle gains with the protein timed conditions than with the protein delayed conditions. So we wrote this paper called Nutrient Timing Revisited. Uh, this was published in uh, the Journal of the International Society of Sports Nutrition. Or for those of you guys who know and, and love the publication, Jizen. So we uh, <laughs> published that thing in Jizen. Uh, by the way, Joey Antonio laughs every time you call it Jizen. So he's got a <laughs> sense of humor. So shout out Good Joey Antonio. <laughs> um, and so that was that paper kind of lit up the 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 community because we were challenging the idea that the post exercise anabolic window was valid. And so our position was, it's, it's not valid to focus on a single time point relative to the training bout within the whole day that would determine whether your muscles grow or not. Because for one thing, what you have pre-exercise is going to take one to two hours to peak in blood circulation. Um, so if you have a pre-exercise meal of, let's say, a substantive amount of carbohydrate and protein, those blood levels of glucose and amino acids are going to reach peak levels in blood circulation one to two hours after you've consumed the meal. So instead of looking at when you consume the actual meal, because, because uh, let me back up a second. If you consume a, a, your, your magic protein and carbohydrate meal immediately post-exercise, all right, you think you're doing everything you can to take advantage of this so-called anabolic window, 30 to 60 minutes post-exercise. So you immediately, as soon as you're done with your last set, you slam your dextrose and whey shake, okay? Um, that, okay, I, I got so animated, I, I messed up my, my wiring here no, that's so, what it's... so if you do that your blood levels of glucose and amino acids are going to peak one to two hours after you finished your workout <laughs> so, <laughs> so instead of looking at um when you should ingest nutrients it makes a little more sense to think about when to maximize nutrient availability in the blood, okay? So in this sense, if you wanted to theoretically take advantage of the post-exercise um, anabolic window, you would actually time your protein and carbohydrates to a degree of peaking in the blood immediately post-exercise. And that would be like immediately pre-exercise, uh, you train sure. for an hour, and then bam, you've got the highest possible levels of glucose and amino acids to replenish whatever, what was used or depleted. Um, and so that was our, our 
our, our case. We said, why are you looking at the immediate post-exercise window when the pre-exercise meal basically becomes the post-exercise meal by virtue of the time course that it takes for nutrients to peak in the blood? And so it just didn't make sense, you know? So we took things a step further and we said, why not look at a time period called, called the peri-exercise window, if you will. So the peri-exercise window would be the time period between the pre-exercise meal and the post-exercise meal. So this space right here, that's peri-exercise. Right. The workout is going to happen somewhere between that area, right? So why not have a significant hit of protein at the both ends of the peri-exercise period? And do not let the peri-exercise period be longer than five to six hours in between. So that way you're covered on both ends. You're covered by going into the workout with high levels of, of fuel substrates and anabolic substrates in the blood. And then when it starts dipping off, you're covered once again with uh, replenishing whatever was used dur during the training bout. And so that was what we proposed in um, our paper. We said, forget about this narrow post-exercise anabolic window. If you're going to do timing, do it right and, and cover both and sandwich the workout with protein, with protein on, on both sides. So that was our uh, recommendation. And then after we did that paper, we said, okay, you know what? It's time to look at all of these studies that compared protein timing it within the anabolic window versus delayed protein. And let's do a meta-analysis on these studies. So that's what we did. We found oh, roughly like 13 studies, I believe. Um, and it was a total of like 500 subjects or so uh, in, in all, all the 13 studies. We did a meta-analysis that compared protein immediately consumed next to the training bout versus protein delayed a minimum of two hours. And what we found was the protein timed conditions or the, when the protein was consumed close to the workout, most of these studies did not equate protein between the protein timed conditions and the protein delayed conditions. So what they would do, they would literally compare protein supplementation post-exercise versus nothing at all. <laughs> versus nothing right, at all. Right. In that area that were used to support the protein timing or the anabolic window concept, they could not isolate whether it was the protein timing near the, the, near the training bout that worked or whether it was just the extra protein for the day that was doing the magic. And so in our meta-analysis, we found that as long as, uh, we found that the, the superior effects were due to total daily protein. So 1.6-ish to 1.7 grams per kilogram of body weight was the average intake of the protein-timed conditions. So 1.6, 1.7. And then among the, uh, the treatment arms or among the groups that did not do the protein timing, their average protein intake was 1.3 grams per kilogram. So it really wasn't a timing thing that gave the advantage. Right, it's it not a fair comparison. The... And so, can you can you hear me, Daniel? Yeah, I just heard like, a little bit, but oh, uh, there you go. There you go. Let me see what's up with this thing here. Can you hear me? Just hear a little boss. Okay, hold on. There you go. Can hear you just fine now. I know. Yeah, you're you're kind of breaking up a little bit. Too. Let me, let me see if I can monkey with this a little bit. Yeah, sure. A lot. No worry. One, one second. <laughs> this is crazy. All right. Is this still breaking up? I'm, I'm still hearing this weird sound. I can see you and hear you okay there. Just a little bit of that bossing from time to time. I can't hear you there. 
I'm just gonna take this stupid little thing out. Oh, there you go. There you go. How how's it? Is it working out okay now? It's working very well now. Can oh, you hear okay. me okay? Oh man, damn! I said a whole long, long ass thing where the thing was. Like, oh, shit. <laughs> no, 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 it was just it was just for a little bit, man. Don't worry. Okay, dude. So okay, so I'm gonna summarize it in like 20 seconds, just because I nobody could hear me with what I said. So in our meta analysis, we found that the advantage of the so-called protein timed conditions was due to there being a greater amount of daily, total daily protein in the protein timed conditions compared to the protein delayed conditions. Because with the protein delayed stuff, they didn't add the protein at some other point in the day. They just, they just left it as is and they added protein to the anabolic window conditions. And so, our meta-analysis found that as long as protein is consumed at 1.6 to 1.7 grams per kilogram of body weight, then there was an, uh, there was an advantage for uh, muscle growth. And it wasn't about the timing. Okay, so now seeing that th that was the case with our meta-analysis, we saw that there was a lack of studies in the literature that compared immediate pre-exercise protein with immediate post-exercise protein. So, because, you, you know, I talked about the concept of um, nutrient availability versus nutrient ingestion. So we wanted to see whether this post-exercise anabolic window concept, if it was compared with like a pre-exercise model, what would happen? And so uh, my colleagues and I, ran a study, a longitudinal study, where we compared an immediate consumption of 25 grams of protein pre-exercise with um, immediate post-exercise consumption, 20, 25 grams of uh, whey protein post-exercise. And we ran the experiment for a number of weeks and measured muscle gains. And we measured body composition. There was no significant difference between immediate pre-exercise consumption and immediate post-exercise consumption. Uh, and, you know, this is not too surprising because total daily protein was optimized. It was set at about 1.8 grams per kilogram of body weight. And so really what we've come to conclude from, from this research and from the studies that we did and from the meta-analysis that we did it's not really about how protein is timed relative to training. It's more about general distribution through the course of the day. So if we take dis protein, the concept of protein distribution, we're talking about how protein is dosed, like how many grams of protein per feeding, how many fe feedings per day. That's, that's kind of what the question comes down to in terms of if you're going to look at timing, Timing has to fall under this umbrella of total daily protein distribution. Okay, so what we don't know and why it's is still interesting and, and it still requires research that hopefully will get done one day. We don't know what the optimal dosing and distribution of protein is from morning to night that will maximize muscle gains. We don't know. We don't know whether you can consume uh, two meals at 100 grams of protein each or four meals at 50 grams of protein each spread evenly through the day. Right. Resistance trained subjects over, let's say, the course of eight to 12 weeks. We don't know whether there's going to be a, a difference. It would be funny as hell if we ran that experiment and found the two meal a day guys eating 100 grams of protein per meal did just as good as the so-called optimized model where we've got 50 grams a day for four times. So the hy working hypothesis right now, and this is another paper that I've done with, uh, with actually with Brad, um, it's titled how much protein can you consume in a, in, in a single meal? How much protein in a single meal um, maximizes muscle building? I probably messed up the title, but if you just Google, Aragon, how much protein? How much protein? Sure, will come. Aragon, how much protein? It, it'll be at the top. Um, 
if you Google that, we hypothesized that what you should do in principle is maximize muscle protein synthesis per meal. So with every pro, anytime you eat protein, there is a ceiling of, of how much muscle protein synthesis you can get out of the protein dose. So the dose of protein that maxes out the anabolic effect or maxes out muscle protein synthesis is going to be somewhere between, uh, gosh, per the literature, it's going to be right around maybe 0.4 grams. 0.5, per, right? Per, that's, that's like the... Yeah, 0.4 to if you're an older person, and uh, if, if the vol training volume is high, as much as like 0.6, some of the outliers are, are as high as 0.6. So we took the average along with the high end outliers and that range is 0.4 to 0.55. <laughs> I like to say 0.6 because it gets a little crazy if you're gonna split that stuff in 100. <laughs> so 0.4 to 0.6 grams per kilogram of body weight for, to maximize the anabolic effect of the protein dose. So now if you take that range, 0.4 to 0.6, and you keep in mind that about 1.6 grams of protein per day, 1.6 to 2.2 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight per day is gonna maximize muscle growth, then you, you simply, uh, you simply just, just do a simple division. And it comes out to four protein feedings per day at 0.4 to 0.6 grams per kilogram of body weight. And how you distribute that in, um, in an optimal fashion, that's also something that we don't know, but we can hypothesize. It would be relatively evenly spread through the course of the day for the 16 hours that you're awake, dude. Um, you would have a protein dose upon waking. You would have a protein dose pretty soon, you know, like, not right before bed. I mean, you don't have to ha have a shape shape next to your bed before you go to sleep, unless you're a true bro. Um, I used to, man. I used to. I can tell you, man. I used to have my little shaker right after the gym. Even when I used to a couple of times, just a couple of times. I used to wake up, you know, the in the middle of the night, shove a protein shake, and go back oh. to bed. Done it all, man. <laughs> Been there, done that. You're a real bro, man. Uh, oh, I love <laughs> <laughs> my proudest moments. <laughs> it's not your proudest fat. Um, so, so that's the, that's the hy hypothetically, we would have a protein dose in the morning, a protein dose pre bed, and at least two more protein doses uh, it, within in the course of the day. You know, if you wanted to crazy optimize it, you'd have one protein, you'd have it those other two protein doses in the peri exercise window, which is about five, six hours framing the right. resi resistance training bout. So that is the hypothesis, bro. And, and the, of course the, the, the challenge and the problem is we just don't have the research that compares protein feeding frequencies in resistance trainees. We just don't have it. So we just have to take the little hypothetical bits and pieces from the short-term research and form hypotheses. And that's what we've done. Man, you brought a lot of interesting points. One, <laughs> if, if time serves us, the first one, the, the combination of protein and carb intake to, you know, you know the story to spike insulin and all this stuff. Mm. But, but as far as I can recall, some of those studies, when, when they added the carbs, the protein was lower. So maybe the carbs were kind of acting up, acting up to counterbalance that lower protein intake and not just the carbs per se. Can we talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I forgot. I totally forgot about that. That's an important part of the puzzle. Um, when Ivy and Portman were doing their research in, in 2003, 2004, <clears throat> actually, this was earlier than that, they compared amino acids with carbohydrate. And um, the amino acids represented a, an equivalent protein dose of about 10 to 15 grams at most, or at roughly 10 grams of protein. And when you consume this post-exercise by itself, say 10 grams of protein by itself post-exercise, um, and you compare that with 10 to 15 grams of protein plus, let's say 20 to 40 grams of a highly insulinogenic, highly glycemic type of carbohydrate, like either glucose or maltodextrin, or 
even sucrose. Then what happens is the insulin response is higher in the protein carb combination post exercise. And the protein muscle protein synthesis was actually higher in the co ingestion of, of protein and carbs post exercise. Right. But a few years later, they did the same comparisons They either protein by itself or protein plus carbs post exercise you measure muscle protein synthesis. They did those same comparisons, but they used 20 to 25 grams of protein. And interestingly, once you're at like 25 grams of protein per dose, no amount of extra carbohydrate added to that protein further elevated muscle protein synthesis. So that was a, a pretty big breakthrough finding because it invalidated the the concept that you needed to consume carbohydrate with protein in order to maximize muscle protein synthesis. And in 2015, Hulmi and colleagues ran a, a longitudinal study. So now we're, we're actually going to look at body composition and strength changes, not just short term muscle protein synthesis. Yeah, uh, because it's not. Yeah. So what happened with Hulma's study is he compared um, protein intake by itself post-exercise, a good dose of protein, like 30-ish grams of protein, uh, with 50-ish grams of uh, maltodextrin versus that 30 grams of post-exercise protein by itself in resistance trainees over somewhere between eight to 12 weeks, I'm not remembering. But interestingly, the the both of the groups they had the same amount of muscle gains at the end of the study even though one of them consumed protein and carbs post exercise and one of them consumed just protein so now we've got a corroboration of the short term mps data showing no difference between protein yeah. alone versus protein plus carbs as long as you have a certain minimum amount of protein per dose and we we have a corroboration between the short term stuff and then uh, Humi's study where they actually looked at changes in body composition and strength with, with no difference with, with those two conditions. So really that, that was a big na nail in the coffin of uh, one of the big anabolic window concepts that you brought up being the insulin spike post-exercise. So uh -huh. it, the insulin spike post-exercise ended up not mattering at all as long as you had enough protein per dose. And that's why when, when Brad and I wrote our paper on protein dosing distribution, we made sure that that 0.4 was going to cover that minimum dose. The 0.4 grams per kilogram of body weight was going to cover that minimum protein dose per meal to maximize the anabolic effect. Very well, because I think it's also context dependent. It's not the same to, to, to look to maximize muscle hypertrophy as in a fat loss, in a fat loss phase, because there's actually your, your 20. Oh, can you hear me? Okay. I lost you for a bit. Okay. I did lose you too. <laughs> okay. Can you repeat okay. that? You, you said yeah, all, sure. the last thing I heard was context dependent. Yeah, sure. Context dependent. Where is it's maximizing muscle gain or maximizing muscle retention during a fat loss phase? Because there's this 2015 meta years that showed, I, I have it right here, I'm, I'm just reading it, showed fitting frequency was positively associated with reductions in fat mass, meaning maybe more meals, but, but the, the most important caveat. Um, however, sensitivity analysis of the data showed that the positive findings were product of a single study. And I think brings us to the, to the beginning of the conversation about, okay, we're talking about meta analysis. But just one, one study on itself had this important effect on the whole meta. Can we talk briefly about how can we best hmm, manage meal frequency during a fat loss phase with this in mind? Yeah, dude. Um, that meta, that 2015 meta analysis had, I think it had like 15 studies. Um, and one of the studies was in 1996 study by uh, Japanese researchers. I, I, to this day, I don't know how to pronounce the name. Uh, it's I-W-A-O. So, Iwao, something like that. 
I, I might, bros, I might look Japanese, but um, <laughs> that happens the same to me, man. I just see it, some names and I go, oh, they, <laughs> they showed, these people showed. I might look Japanese, but I grew up being called Iho and Chiquilio. Okay. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I'm serious. I'm dead serious. So um, the, that study had such a large effect size. So it had a very, very, um, when we did the so-called sensitivity analysis, we looked at each study individually and saw what would happen if we took the study out of the, of the total analysis, what would happen? So we did that with each of the studies. And that particular study by Iwao and colleagues had such a, a major impact on the, on the whole analysis that it, it skewed everything in favor of a higher meal frequency. So yeah. now the problem with that is that this particular study was not very, was not very well designed and it was very short. It was a two week study um, and it was, they did a kind of an unrealistically uh, aggressive hypocaloric uh, protocol. And the, I, I also, if I recall correctly, their total protein intake for the day was highly suboptimal. And so the, the experiment itself was just methodologically, it was kind of crappy design wise. You would never do the no. things in the real world that they did in that study. And it was very short. So we decided, you know what, we're not going to, we're, we're going to mention our results, but we're also going to mention without that one study, n it wouldn't have made a difference at all. Like meal frequency would not have made a difference at, at all in the total meta-analysis. And so that's one of the limitations with meta-analysis, man. It, it, um, they're only as good as the studies that are included, you know? And so um, if there's a bunch of studies in the meta-analysis, that are are not great, then your meta analysis is going to be compromised a bit. So, so yeah, what our our meal frequency meta analysis basically concluded that you know what, uh, with the exception of that one study showing a huge effect, meal frequency and body composition doesn't matter whether you have two meals a day or nine meals a day, <laughs> as long as your totals for the day are on point, then you know, a, a relatively similar amount of fat loss will occur. But um, we also threw in the, the caution that this may or may not, th this is when we're looking at the general population. Sure. The general population, people who sit around and watch Netflix all the time, you know, the difference between, let's say, one meal a day and, and six meals a day might not, might not matter. But if we're looking at athletes, well, then meal frequency might matter and and um my opinion on that is that it whether you're trying to gain muscle during um eucaloric or hypercaloric conditions or whether you're trying to um retain muscle in hypocaloric conditions that can influence the optimization of meal frequency so if you're if you're somebody whose your goal is to lose fat and you're going to run a caloric deficit. So you may be consuming, let's say 250 to 500 calories below maintenance calorie needs. So you can impose that deficit and expedite the fat loss process. Interestingly, there's a lot of research, man, especially on things like uh, uh, intermittent fasting, time-restricted feeding. Um, it shows that a stupidly low level of meal frequency still results in the preservation of lean body mass. So uh, I, it almost doesn't matter how low you go in meal frequency as long as you hit your proper totals in macronutrition by the end of the day um, if the goal is, is to keep your muscle during fat loss. If that's just the goal, just keep the muscle, then yeah, you can consume two meals a day. One meal a day is a little bit impractical for, for most people. A lot of people can't do that. It's just um, right, right. It's not realistic. But mo most people, the low end of two meals a day, a lot of people can do that. And if they prefer to, to do that, then that's fine. They'll probably still keep, keep their muscle tissue in hypocaloric conditions. Now, the other group of folks who they don't care about 
keeping muscle in a caloric deficit. They want to make gains. They want to make gains with a Z, all right? Sign me up, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, when that is your goal, then you have to exhaust all the hypothetical um, – you have to turn over all the hypothetical stones that would, that would bias the process towards muscle growth. And doing that involves as many maximal anabolic events in the course of the day. Because the accumulation of maximal muscle protein synthetic events through the day over a period of days, weeks, months, and years, at least in theory, would result in a faster rate of muscle growth. So if right. one guy, so if one guy is only maximizing muscle protein synthesis twice a day, and then the guy next to him is consuming the same amount of protein, but is maximizing muscle protein synthesis four times a day, well, then total muscle protein synthesis is going to be higher in the four times a day guy than the two times a day guy, and so over a period of weeks and months. Well, then, at least hypothetically, because unfortunately, we don't have this study. I would love to see the study done. Hypothetically, the guy who spiked MPS to maximal degrees more times a day is going to gain more muscle in three months, six months, one year than the guy who just did it twice a day. That's what I think. It gets lost in, gets lost in translation that it's about maximizing hypertrophy and also in that 2013 paper you actually stated so maybe some people decided to ignore it they didn't read it but it actually says in the 2013 paper um, that pre and post exercise meals should not be separated more than three to four hours which is not to say as many people myself included because well dichotomy thinking i'm trying to work on that you know oh nutrient timing doesn't matter at all man if, if you want to maximize the the hypertrophic response from from resistance training It, it, it really does matter. Maybe it's not a, to an incredible degree, but it does matter. Yeah, yeah, totally, man. It, it does matter. And, and I got into a, an argument like 15 years ago, 10 years ago, with one of my, one of my good friends named Scott Stevenson. And uh, he, he drew this analogy. It's like, it's like playing 18 holes of golf or something like that. Yeah. So one guy could um, be doing better putts with e each time each hole he he ha he does better with with each hole <laughs> and by the uh, by the 18th hole he wins because he did better with each each um increment and so if you do better on a daily basis with um <laughs> on a daily basis baby please um, <laughs> the louis marco fans are going to get that um if you do better on on the daily then the weekly and the monthly should and, and the yearly should reflect that and so that's the hypothesis but like i said man it, that's a gray area in the literature and a lot of it sometimes comes down to well, what population are you dealing with you know are you are you dealing with guys who are competing in a strength and power sport or competing in physique sports or are you dealing with weekend warriors um general population guys desk jockeys you know soccer dads right who are we who are we talking about so with like soccer dads and soccer moms the difference man between like three protein feedings a day and more is probably not going to uh be meaningful because you're not on the pose you're not on the posing stage and and you're not being judged by you know the amount of striations in separation in the <laughs> in the glutes and, and, and things like things like that you know the amount of symmetry side to side top to bottom with the physique if you're not being judged on those things then you know three three meals a day three protein feedings a day versus four or five six it's it's probably not going to matter but um right. it's always fun just like as as a hobby or or a recreational thing to kind of know what, what is hypothetically optimal so you can spend periods of time trying to pursue muscle growth and know that you're doing everything that we know of to make that happen. So, um, yeah. 
Right, so Alan, just to finish up, if you have the time, of course, can, can you give us some, some, some brief takeaways, whether in, where we're looking to maximize muscle hypertrophy or yeah. maximize muscle retention in regards to meal frequency and timing? Sure, brother. Um, okay, so the, the first tier of importance is total daily protein. Total daily protein. Right. And that, as far as we know today, is going to range from as low as 1.6 grams per kilogram of body weight. Now, I know some of you guys are going to think I'm going to top out at 2.2 because of the meta, meta analysis. But I'm going to say, man, 1.6 to th double that, 3.2 grams per kilogram of body weight is the, the range that will cover all of the goals. So um, the 3.2, that's more of your dieting, lean, resistance trainees who are either serious recreational athletes or competitive athletes in the physique area, okay? So that's the 3.2 grams per kilo, guys. 1.6 to 2.2 is going to pretty much cover um, all of the regular folks, okay? All of the, uh, all of the, the mortals, all right? <laughs> or if you're mortal, 1.6 to 2.2 grams per kilogram of body weight is going to cover you. Um, so that's total daily, which is the first tier of importance. Um, second tier of importance would be distribution through the day. As far as protein, now we're just talking about protein. Um, if you want to optimize and, and maximize the growth process, then you'd be looking at 0.4 to 0.6 grams per kilogram of body weight per meal. And you're going to want to carry that through a minimum of four times through the day. All right? Sure, sure. So that distribution right there would maximize muscle growth. Now, For those of you who don't really care about muscle growth, you just want to hang on. You want to maintain. You want to either maintain your muscle in whatever conditions, and especially during hypocaloric conditions, then that doesn't really apply. I, um, you just kind of go with what you prefer. You know, you, do, you don't necessarily have to worry about a certain minimum amount of protein per meal as long as you're getting the total, that 1.6 to 3.2 um, grams per kilogram of body weight. You know, the 2.2 is the official pu <laughs> published limit, but I'm going to say 3.2. We're going to get in trouble with Stu Phillips, man. <laughs> Stu, you know, <laughs> yeah, Stu, bro, sit down, Stu. Sit, <laughs> sit your Canadian ass down. Stu. <laughs> I didn't say it, man. <laughs> <laughs> he, doesn't watch, he doesn't watch these things anyway, so I can say whatever yeah. the hell I want to. <laughs> um. And, and uh, yeah, if, if, you're, if you're dieting, then the frequency of protein feedings per day. If you want to eat protein twice a day, cool. You'll, you'll still keep muscle. If you want to eat protein once a day in this huge meal, most people, it's impractical for most people, but hypothetically, you could, sure. still, you could still hang on to muscle. Um, as far as uh, athletic performance and, and carb timing and all that stuff, that's a whole other thing. <laughs> That's a whole other thing, but at, we're talking yeah, about um, sure. body composition goals. Then that, right, that's kind of what it comes down to, man. And um, I want to mention what, one, one little thing as far as uh, keeping muscle while dieting. The rate of, of, weight, of weight loss, which is, which is reflective of the aggressiveness of the caloric deficit, that is going to have, a, have an impact on whether you preserve lean body mass while you lose body fat. So um, the rate of weight loss should be limited to about half a percent to a full percent of mm -hmm. your body weight per week. And then you can increase your chances that you will keep muscle tissue as you lose body fat. Um, as far as minimizing fat gains, when you gain lean mass, well, it's the same guideline, half a percent to a full percent of your total body weight, but you, you want to, um, but this is on a monthly basis. 
So, uh, so yeah, that th those are the two little little things that at the end I wanted to add. It's just rates of progress are going to influence what kind of tissue that you either gain or lose. And so, with with muscle gains, you want to limit that to, um, you know, roughly half to a whole kilogram um, per month, and then the same thing with fat loss, but per week. So roughly half to a full kilogram loss per week, and then you retain muscle. So. Very well. So, Alan, I want to be super exculpatory of your time. It's been super fun. <laughs> I got lots of, lots of fun today. I'll be looking forward to your book. I, I'll be sure to DM you. Thanks, yeah, thanks for that, man, by the way. There's only like 10 real hardcore bros that are true bros who've actually drank protein shakes in the middle of the night and you being one of them i have to send you a book wasn't pleasant but it wasn't pleasant but i can tell you it was worth it as of today <laughs> just because of that man. yeah buddy yeah buddy hey man um thank you so much for inviting me on and uh thanks to thank you all of you guys your audience thank you for tuning in and i hope everybody stays safe out there don't get covid too many times and uh we're, yeah. we're all gonna make it man I sure hope so. so. Have a great rest of the day, Alan. It's been a huge pleasure and honor. Hope to talk to you soon. Yeah, buddy. Take care, man. Thank you again. See you, man. Bye-bye. Right.